Good evening, everyone. Yeah, I think this is working. Can everyone hear me? Louder? Louder? Okay. Can everyone hear me now? Good. Okay. Um, welcome, everyone. My name is Ken Yalowitz. I'm the director of the Dickey Center for International Understanding uh, here at Dartmouth. And I'm very, very pleased to welcome uh, you to what is now the, the final session uh, of our Portsmouth Treaty Conference uh, here at Dartmouth. Uh, we are limited in time till roughly about 9.30 and we have two panels tonight. So I will be uh, blessedly for you uh, brief in my introductory comments. I wanted to begin first of all though by thanking all the participants who've come, you know, from some from a quite a long distance from Russia, from Japan, uh, and from all around the United States. I really, all of us appreciate uh, the fact that you took time from your busy schedules uh, and helped make this conference so meaningful uh, for all of us. I also wanted to say on a personal note uh, to some very dear colleagues and friends uh, who shared uh, many, many years in the Foreign Service of the United States together, uh, Ambassador Jim Collins, Ambassador Tom Simons and his wife Peggy, and Wayne Mary, I, Wayne's here, good too, but uh, all, to all three of you, it's a real pleasure uh, to have you here. And I also just wanted to thank uh, Ambassador uh, Kitaoka, who's uh, come down, or actually come up <coughs> from, uh, from his very significant duties at the United Nations today, and we're very appreciative that you took the time uh, to come here today. There are many people uh, who work very, very hard to make this conference uh, successful. And uh, at the very top of the list, I'd certainly like to thank the provost, uh, Barry Scheer. Barry is here. Um, Barry is uh, my conference uh, co-convener, and he's been enormously generous in terms of his support and his personal involvement. And I think uh, you probably also heard his wonderful introduction to John Dower the other evening, uh, but we're really indebted to you, Barry, for all that you've done and very, very appreciative. Uh, and also to the Dean of Faculty, uh, Carol Folt, uh, for her support. Next, I'd like to recognize uh, our two academic co-chairs, uh, Professors Alan Hockley and Stephen Erickson. Two years of very, very hard work, a great deal of dedication, a great deal of time and energy uh, that both of them uh, have spent. And all I can say is that working with the two of you has been a real pleasure. Uh, and to me, it's a model of how you know, such a conference you know, can be put together. So Steve and Alan, there's Alan, where's Stephen? Uh, if you both just stand up, as I say, you guys really, really, really deserve it. And also, uh, to, thanks to Professor Ron Edsforth, you know, for sharing his vision uh, of this conference. It was very, very valuable to us. And finally, uh, a real special word of thanks to my staff at the Dickey Center for International Understanding. Uh, Rob Clough, Victoria Hicks, uh, Diane Casey, and Margot uh, De La Toile. Rob, there, Rob is standing over there. But just a tremendous amount of, of effort and, and hard work uh, and we're really appreciative for all you've done. <laughs> I must admit, uh, as a former diplomat, uh, as we began planning this conference two years ago, uh, we sort of entertained the hope that maybe somehow here at Dartmouth uh, in September of the year 2005, uh, that we would be able materially to help bring about a conclusion uh, to this last great unfinished chapter of World War II. Uh, the fact that uh, Russia and Japan have not signed uh, you know, a peace treaty, that there is no formal conclusion uh, to the World War II hostilities. And of course, the major issue being uh, the Northern Territories that we discussed uh, earlier today. Um, that obviously uh, was a dream, hasn't happened. But what we decided, and we were not naive, we knew the chances were probably not great, but we decided, therefore, uh, to conclude this conference uh, with a two-part panel. The first would offer a very concrete area of cooperation uh, between 
uh, Japan, the United States, and Russia. Uh, in, in, in the Russian Far East and Northeast Asia, which we would hope would have helped create uh, and improve uh, the dialogue and improve the overall situation uh, in which uh, the Russian-Japanese relationship proceeds today. And the second part of this panel, as we envisaged it, um, would focus specifically on the implications of the Portsmouth Treaty for overcoming uh, the still uh, extant difficulties and obstacles today. Global health issues have become a very important priority of our work at the Dickey Center and at Dartmouth in, in, in terms of a, a global health initiative that we have launched here on the campus. And this is in recognition uh, that uh, multifaceted health issues are critical uh, to the national security, politi political and economic well-being, and the social fabric of many countries today. And I would also recognize uh, Dean Steven Spielberg of, of the Dartmouth Medical School, who's with us, uh, who we have really partnered together on this global health initiative. Uh, uh, this is very, very important to us. But during discussions prior to the conference uh, with one of the participants in the health panel, Dr. Edward Berger, we became familiar with the important work that is already going on uh, in the Russian Far East in terms of improving uh, overall health conditions. And reference has already been made earlier today to demographic issues, both in the Russian Far East and uh, in Japan, but for different reasons. Um, and we decided that uh, at this conference that it would be a very, very good outcome uh, to do something concrete in the area of healthcare uh, in the Russian Far East and uh, Northeast uh, Asia. And we're very, very pleased, therefore, that we have three distinguished representatives of the medical profession from the United States, Russia, uh, and Japan who are here this evening. And they will be signing very, very shortly uh, a protocol on future cooperation in the area of health uh, in the Russian Far East and Northeast Asia. And I'm also very pleased to state, and I will read uh, this uh, 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 document before, we act before it's actually signed, but the Dickey Center will be sponsoring a follow-up meeting involving hopefully uh, these three wonderful individuals uh, here at Dartmouth uh, next spring to begin to put some teeth into this protocol to actually you know, figure out what exactly uh, we can do together. So I'd now like to uh, introduce uh, briefly uh, our three uh, medical panelists. I'm going to ask each of them to speak briefly for about five minutes, and after that, uh, we will have the formal signature of the protocol. So the first speaker, will be uh, Dr. Edward J. Berger. Uh, Ed is a physician and scientist. He is president of the Institute for Health Policy Analysis in Washington, D.C., and is the director of the Eurasian Medical Education Program. Uh, he served in the White House office of the President's Science Advisor uh, during the early 1970s, and helped develop cooperative programs in science, medicine, and the environment with the Soviet Union during the period of detente. He's been professor of community and family medicine at the Georgetown University Medical Center and has also taught at the Harvard School of Public Health and the John F. Kennedy School of Government in Science and Public Policy. He has been a Guggenheim Fellow and is a member of a number of professional societies. And Ed, may I just take this opportunity also again to thank you uh, for your wonderful advice, cooperation, and all the assistance in putting this panel together uh, and also getting the protocol together. Uh, our participant from Japan uh, is Dr. Uh, Motokazu Hori, uh, who is on the board of trustees of the, Jap of the Russia Japan Medical Exchange Foundation. Dr. Hori was a Fulbright postdoctoral scholar at Harvard Medical School and professor of surgery at Tokyo Women's Medical College and Heart Institute. Subsequently, he was a founding faculty member and professor of surgery 
at the University of Tsukuba and has served as provost, dean, and vice president of that institution. He is now a professor emeritus uh, of Tsukuba uh, and the China Medical University. Dr. Hori has been president of the Japan Society for Medical Education since 1997, and he was awarded the Ushiba Prize for Medical Education uh, in 1996. And finally, uh, Dr. Svetlana Kishinka. Dr. S uh, Dr. Kishinka is Vice President for International Affairs at the Far Eastern National Medical University in Khabarovsk, where Jim Collins and I visited uh, about 10 years ago. Uh, she is also a member of the Department of Family Medicine at Boston University School of Medicine and clinical assistant professor at East Tennessee, uh, East Tennessee State University's James H. Quillen College of Medicine. She is experienced in the organization and development of regional and international primary health care projects and has also worked with the World Health Organization office at the United Nations. She's been awarded several international fellowships for her research including one for improving access to health care and human services, and another in family medicine. And may I ask uh, Dr. Berger to lead off? Dr. Berger. Health is a security issue. That phrase is sometimes accused of being used and too often. I'm accused of using it perhaps too often. I will stipulate that, in fact, in this case, health is a security issue. There's a self-interest in all, of all nations in economic prosperity and in political and social stability at home, among contiguous nations, and among those who are distant but are involved in trade and commercial activities, however distant. Bismarck re realized this matter in Germany in the late 1880s when he moved explicitly to put in place a series of social and health uh, and welfare initiatives in order to pr preserve social stability and reduce the power of political opposition in his case. We can discuss this issue at several levels, and I would like to just summarize a few, about four. I would say, first of all, that we are presented with an extraordinary challenge, but an even more extraordinary opportunity. To, in, in the Russian setting. The challenge, the health challenge is indicated by, as you all know, the Russians' dev, uh, devastating demographic decline. Russia is losing an estimated 600 to 900,000 people a year in ex in, uh, over that which it should, uh, uh, which it, uh, should not for two reasons. One is a reduced fertility and the other is excess mortality. The, it is the excess mortality issue that is of particular interest to us. Those figures, incidentally, are net of in, any in-migration. And the second and related matter is that the qualitative trend associated with the quali quali quantitative one is that the number, as uh, the Ministry of Economic Development and Trade in Moscow said not very long ago, the decline in the number of economically active people, productive citizens versus retirees, is declining dangerously. The major contributor to the excess or premature mortality <coughs> and life-threatening complications um, are uh, accrue from underlying untreated chronic disease, principally cardiovascular disease. Deaths from heart attacks and stroke far outnumber by orders of magnitude, those from uh, infectious processes, for example. And the major point is that these are preventable and remediable, and that's the opportunity. This was the experience in the West <clears throat> where uh, we, beginning in the 1960s, recalibrated what we considered was normal blood pressure and ag aggressively chose to treat blood pressure at that new level with very inexpensive drugs, diuretics. As a result, we were able to decrease cardiovascular mortality by about 60 percent 
from that period onward. And this was well be beginning well before the concern for smoking took place. In the Russian case, all three of cardiovascular disease, TB, and HI eventually HIV AIDS will combine to exercise their impact on middle-aged males in their most productive years. The, the, uh, the, the impact of cardiovascular disease, of underlying chronic disease, overwhelms the others at the present time. The cut, what, are, what are the significance? What is the significance of all of this? The consequence of the growing epidemic of chronic disease for many nations is uh, with which are showing growing prosperity is a fascinating and a uh, uh, process and one that is will engender uh, I think a, a serious concerns as nations gradually become more prosperous they assume the character and the habits of those already prosperous and the diseases that go along with prosperity secondly with education People learn about, the citizens learn about the interventions that are available for treating acute diseases, acute complications of underlying disease, heart attacks and strokes. And with the increasing amounts of democratic governance, <clears throat> nation, the populace of nations will insist on having those interventions available, and that will break, break the bank. That's a strong argument for preventing the underlying uh, pre preventing the, uh, under the uh, consequences of underlying cardiovascular chronic disease. Secondly, there the, is the relationship between health and economic growth. A World Health Organization report of a few years ago called Macroeconomics and Health talked about or studied in great detail the relationship between health and economic growth. One usually concern considers that uh, growing economies will produce better health, that all boats will rise. The report indicated that health is both an independent and a dependent variable, that one both uh, have effect on each other. And it is predicted that Russia will not be able to achieve its full economic potential without attending to its health status. Let me give you one example. Um, a calculation has been made that by 2040, the cohort of males who are expected to enter university in Russia will be exactly the same cohort of males demanded by the military. <clears throat> that, that will suggest some, some choices to be made. And then there's the issue of health as an uh, instrument of foreign policy. This is an idea that is often talked about, but rarely, really seized upon seriously <clears throat> uh, and taken seriously. In the heat of practical debates over how to deal with the balance of power, cooperation in science and medicine is not uncommonly discounted uh, by those favoring big sticks and tools of force. Interestingly enough to me, this apparently was the debate of the Special Council of Ministers in St. Petersburg in April 1903 among Vitti, Lambsdorff, Pleve, and Vesuborazov. Um, all contending for the Tsar's attention uh, concerning strategies to the, for the Far East. Bezobrazov urged a firm policy in defense of Russian interests. Vitti made his final bid for a policy of moderation. Lambsdorff argued that diplomatic affairs in the Far East should be left to diplomats and solemn treaties should be honored. And Plevi replied that bayonets, not diplomats, had made Russia and that the Far East problems would have to be solved by bayonets and not by diplomatic pens. It's been unusual, as I say, to see a consistent, dedicated policy of cooperation in social and health sectors as a principal component of national strategy. The last time the United States set upon this sort of a strategy was 1941, when a very extensive, very successful 15-year program was put in place in Latin America with a number of self-interests involved, with the strong backing of President Franklin Roosevelt and with the oversight of Nelson Rockefeller. It was run outside the government. It was run 
with, by engaging in an enormous amount of professional assistance and talent and advice, it was highly successful. And if the experience has not been repeated since then, there is a place for it. What did it do? Sorry? What did it do? I mean, oh. <laughs> well, what it did, what the, the origin was the following. Uh, we needed to station trips, tr uh, troops in Brazil. There was malaria in Brazil. We had to do away with parasitic disease. We wanted rubber and other uh, natural resources. We wanted to protect the Panama Canal. And um, Nelson Rockefeller persuaded Roosevelt to put in place a program that did several things. It trained large numbers of people at both ends of the axis. It built hospitals and clinics. It cleaned up parasitic disease. It operated through a series of what were called servicios in each of 18 Latin American countries with the understanding that each of the host nations would take over the financing eventually, which they did. It uh, stands as a monument to great success. And it was run, as I say, by way of a specially set up 501c3 not-for-profit entity incorporated in Delaware for the purpose. <laughs> then there's the issue of professional exchanges. Health and medicine like science are neutral affairs whose benefits flow universally. Best of all, the professional to professional exchange is the in the best tradition of education, the sharing of skills and knowledge. These always tend to rise above state boundaries. The Japan-Russia Medical Exchange Foundation begun in 1992 and our program, the Eurasian Medical Education Program of the American College of Physicians, which has engaged nearly 7,000 Russian physicians since 97, I think have been more than reasonably successful. And they've proved the point. And the importance of exchanges, of engaging non-governmental interests has occurred in the best, uh, and the best, and has engaged the best of professional resources. Well, consider the special challenge of the present era. It's a fascinating dynamic. It's a chessboard that I must say is, uh, I find, um, most intriguing in Northeast Asia at this point, and in Southeast Asia, um, comparing and contrasted to the era of 1905, for example. Very rapid enhancement of economic prowess of the People's Republic of China, with a strong desire on their part for natural resources. Russia, Russia rich with natural resources, especially extractable materials. And Japan, still the second largest economy and a contender for energy resources, and a rich portfolio of trade and commercial relations. Then there's the Shanghai Cooperation Organization, a new amalgam of states that represent nearly 50% of the world's population. And I repeat what I said at the outset. It's in the interest of all hands that social stability and economic health be fostered and enhanced. I am delighted to be able to join with my two colleagues in signing the agreement. And let me finally uh, just read a sentence from Dr. Taro Nakayama, the former foreign minister, physician, and the founder of the Russia-Japan Medical Exchange Program. Among other things, he's, uh, he, he is not here because uh, Prime Minister Koizumi had the questionable grace to call an election, <laughs> and he was campaigned for his seat tomorrow. But he said, I wish to convey my support <clears throat> for your initiative to draw up a protocol of Japan-U.S.-Russian cooperation to improve the medical situation in Russia. Ambassador Yelowitz, we are most grateful to you for putting this together and for inviting this particular initiative. Thank you. Dr. Horry. Ambassador Presa. Ladies and gentlemen, good evening. Although there are some still unsolved problems in Japan and Russia uh, during the six decades after the Second World War, we, our foundation, represented by Dr. Taro Nakayama, former 
foreign minister uh, decided to promote friendship between two countries by means of medical cooperation and established this our foundation in April 1992. Our foundation facilitates an exchange of medical information through education and training between two countries, organizes the training of physicians and nurses, uh, and also the exchange of medical students uh, for the future as well. And our foundation holds annual medical symposia. The medical symposium, symposia are held every year, alternatively in Japan and in Russia. And this year's meeting will be uh, the 12th since 1993. The first symposium, symposium was held in Niigata in 1993. The second was held in Vladivostok in Russia, and so on. Next week, we will have the twelfth, one dozens <laughs> symposium in Krasnoyarsk in Soviet, Siberia, in Siberia. There are 13 cooperative medical academies and universities in Russia. The headquarter is located in Khabarovsk. Uh, as the counterparts, we have 31 Japanese medical schools out of 80, mainly uh, on the Japan Sea side, not on the Pacific Ocean side. The most issues of our symposium, well, number one is public health and preventive medicine. Uh, we in introduced the Russian physicians, nurses, and <laughs> students. Uh, our experience as the longest long longevity of life in the world. Uh, each year, we discuss on preventive medicine and public health first. Number two subject is always cardiovascular diseases, cancer, and cerebrovascular diseases. For example, next week from uh, next week, we will have three days Symposium in Krasnoyarsk. Participants from Japan will be almost 50, and Russian participants will be more than 300. Besides, every year, symposia we have one of the most advanced technologies of endoscopic diagnosis and treatment in the world. We founded and donated two endoscopic centers in Krasnoyarsk and Khabarovsk since past 10 years. 
every year two or three physicians and two or three nurses come to Japan from Far East Siberia for a mutual communication and mutual training for both Russian and Japanese physicians, nurses, and students. Uh, this is only an outline of medical exchange program between our two countries. If you are interested in details, I will be very happy to explain for you. Thank you very much for your attention. <coughs> Dr. Kishin. Thank you. Good evening. This is a privilege for Far Eastern National Medical University to participate in this event, and it is an honor personal for me in sign an agreement among a respected group of leaders, including Dr. Berger and Dr. Horian, in such an important subject. I am impressed with the initiative you have taken in building and fostering international partnership to combat HIV AIDS and improve continued medical education in the Russian Far East. Unfortunately, health care remains a low priority for the Russian government, while the Russian people take too little responsibilities for their personal health. As a result, inadequate funding of preventive health care, alcohol abuse, high rates of tobacco use, and other unhealthy lifestyle choices <coughs> have reduced life expectancy in the Russian Federation, especially among males. I'm sure that tri-national partnership have a unique role to play yeah, in a global. Honor. Oh, sorry. <laughs> I'm sure that tri-national partnership have a unique role to play in a global level. And I do hope that efforts and input made by international community to fight against HIV AIDS and eradicate diseases such as tuberculosis and hepatitis would be successfully replicated in the Russian Far East. And in the long run, it would be result in positive behavioral changes. Thank you very much for your attention. And I would like to say thank you so much, Ambassador Yalovitz and all organizers of this event. Thanks a lot. I'll just read very briefly uh, a couple of sentences, the operative portions of this protocol. Uh, it reads, accordingly, uh, this agreement represents a commitment to engage in an ongoing program of continuing or postgraduate med medical education and medical scientific symposia among the members of the professional leadership groups of all three nations, Japan, Russia and the United States. And then it reads further, the parties look forward to the first planning meeting under this memorandum to be held at Dartmouth College in Hanover, New Hampshire in the spring of 2006. So now we will proceed to the signing. Let's see, I have to make sure I have the right languages here. <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Hori? Yes. The Japanese and the Russian. And then we'll, Thank you. Rob, we'll, we'll just trade. Did you hear the question, Dr. Kishin? No, I, I wasn't sure. 
go ahead. No, no, please go ahead. Go ahead. Sign. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. brings back a lot of memories. <laughs> <laughs> presented with this bottle, which is apparently 100-year-old sake. I believe that's just the label. I'm not sure it's 100 years old. But we thought it would be very fitting uh, for the participants to toast the signing with 100-year-old sake. So we'll see. These are all doctors. They know what they're doing. They know what they're doing to us. Right. <laughs> Were you a uh, long life? Long life, life yes. No, <laughs> success. Cheers. Oh, good. <laughs> good. Uh, I'm fine. Yeah. That's the right. Excellent. <laughs> okay. Longer than, longer than 100 years. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Potent. <laughs> Peggy, yeah, Peggy had a question. Please oh, go I'm ahead. I'm curious about the exchanges. Um, it, what language is being used? And you were talking about the number of people that you exchange. <coughs> you had, you said doctors, nurses, do you go to Tokyo or to Japan? <laughs> sorry, to Tokyo. And that, do you use Japanese? Do they speak Russian? Usually the working language is English, and uh, yes. <laughs> we translate everything we bring over in, into Russian. Yes. And um, visual materials and printed materials. Some of our physicians who come over speak Russian. Uh, otherwise, we use interpreters over there. I think uh, <coughs> life custom, life uh, style of Japanese people will be very, very good uh, for the uh, long life. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Uh, yes. <laughs> Japanese food will be very good for your health, too, I think. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Yes. some retired physicians who went to Russia to introduce them to a campaign against tobacco smoke. Uh -huh. Are you familiar with that? I wish it was a few long. years yeah. ago. It Ellis was Rowland. Dr. Yes. 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 Oh, okay. Good. Um, yeah. Was it effective? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay, now we will move to uh, what is the final, final panel. Uh, and this is one that um, I await with a great deal of uh, personal anticipation as a former diplomat. What we're going to focus on now, um, basically, is what are the lessons learned from Portsmouth, this treaty signed 100 years ago, uh, and how might those lessons uh, be applied today 
uh, to contribute to a Japanese-Russian peace settlement and to improvement uh, in relationships uh, in Northeast Asia. And I underline we are very fortunate to have a very distinguished panel of speakers here tonight. Um, all of them have very extensive and very relevant uh, experience and expertise uh, to address uh, these questions that I've described. I've asked each of them to speak for approximately 15 minutes, uh, which will leave us time for questions and answers you know, from, from you. Uh, and let me briefly uh, introduce the, uh, the three speakers. The first uh, is Dr. Alexei Bogaturov, and I want to say a special word of thanks to him. Um, the person who was originally slotted to speak um, on behalf of, of Russia tonight in, in this panel, uh, uh, Mr. Um, Evgeny Bajanov, who is the vice rector of the Diplomatic Academy of the Russian Foreign Ministry. Uh, very unfortunately, he and his wife, who was also going to be a participant, uh, were unable to attend the untimely death of, of Mrs. Uh, Bajanova's mother, uh, prevented them from traveling, and certainly our condolences uh, to them. But uh, Dr. Bogaturov uh, very, very kindly agreed to uh, join the panel with very, very short notice. And, uh, again, I may express my appreciation uh, to him. He is Professor of International Politics at Moscow State Institute of International Relations, and he specializes in contemporary international relations and Pacific studies. He's also the Deputy Director of the Institute of International Security Studies of the Russian Academy of Sciences and Editor-in-Chief of the Meju Narodnia Protesi International Trends Journal. And our second speaker is Ambassador uh, Kazuhiku Togo. Ambassador Togo is a research fellow at the Institute for International and Regional Studies and lecturer uh, at the Department of East Asian Studies at Princeton University. But before this uh, uh, latest uh, assignment at uh, Princeton, he had a very distinguished 34-year career uh, in the Japanese Foreign Service. He served as Director General of the Treaties Bureau, uh, Director General of the European and Ocean Oceanian Affairs Bureau, and, and as Ambassador uh, to the Netherlands. He also has very extensive service um, in the former Soviet Union uh, and Russia. Uh, he is all, was also invited as a visiting professor to Moscow State University, Sofia University in, Toki, Tok in Tokyo, and Kiyo University. His publications include Japan and Russia in Search of Breakthroughs, Japan-Russian Relations, Past and Future, and 50 Years of Japanese Foreign Policy, 1945-1995. And finally, uh, Ambassador uh, James, Jim Collins, not James. I, I don't know if I've ever called you James in all the nine years I've known you. Ambassador Jim Collins, uh, a very, very distinguished member um, of the State Department for many, many years, uh, a retired career diplomat, a member of the Senior Foreign Service, uh, many, many very responsible uh, assignments, both in Washington and abroad, uh, and capped uh, by uh, almost a decade of service um, in Moscow uh, at, at one of the most tumultuous times in recent history uh, from the period of, of uh, 2001, uh, I'm sorry, 1991 to 2001. And uh, he served as uh, the ambassador of the United States uh, to the Russian Federation from 1997 to 2001. Currently, uh, Jim is a senior international advisor with the Washington office of Aiken, Gum, Strauss, Hauer, and Feld, and he is also a senior associate of the Belfer Center for Science and International Affairs at the John F. Kennedy School of Government uh, at Harvard University. And first, um, may I ask um, Mr. Bogaturov to speak. In fact, why don't all three of you come up and uh, we will proceed, and then the other speakers. But Mr. Bogaturov, please initiate. Thank you. Dear friends and colleagues, 
First of all, let me say thank you for the privilege to address the distinguished audience, uh, being among distinguished panel of speakers, uh, many of whom I know by writings for many years, and this time I have a chance to see them, uh, to get acquainted with them in person. Uh, let me start in a slightly unusual way, not from what I wanted to talk, uh, uh, but from, uh, from something which would be a direct continuation of what have just happened here. I mean from medical things. Uh, the thing is that President Putin uh, actually participated in, in the celebration of uh, the Portsmouth Treaty, but in his own way. I'm absolutely sure he has no idea that uh, <laughs> that September uh, the, the 5th was the day uh, when the Treaty of Portsmouth was signed, but he chose that day this year, just a week ago, uh, to declare um, his new program on social affairs, and a major part of that is about healthcare in Russia. He suggested uh, major restructuring and primarily, what is, what is primarily important, major increase of salaries for uh, doctors everywhere in Russia. In the course of five months, they plan to increase salaries seven times, which, which is something unusual indeed. <laughs> the other two parts of his project uh, are um, a reform of education, of higher education primarily, and uh, the last one, uh, the reform of system of housing in Russia. So uh, in case it really means some turnover in the priorities of Russian government, that may have direct effect on the problem we discuss for God knows how long and with no practical results so far, unfortunately. Uh, so uh, let me come back uh, to the conference uh, from which I should have proceeded. Uh, so, what was the whole conference about? Uh, after two days of participating, I would say that it was not exclusively and it was not primarily about Russia and Japan. Much more, it was about the order and about American role in, in the historical attempt to set, to impose, I would say, to impose an order in Asia and the Pacific. This is how I see it. And what is especially important from this point of view is that despite mm, quite serious diversity in views and assessment between Russian, Japanese, and sometimes American participants, all the three team of, uh, of speakers uh, recognize that indeed America was the one who initiated, who tried to impose the order. And it did, in fact, impose the order. Another, another question is that the order was not too lasting. Uh, it actually collapsed very soon. But it collapsed due to two major things. First of all, the loss of legitimacy in Russia. And second, due to the rise of nationalism elsewhere in the region, but primarily in Japan. So um, to bridge the gap between the historical aspects and the contemporary aspect, I would say that my task, as I see it for today's panel, is uh, to analyze, to discuss together with you how nationalism, which still remains a major actor in regional affairs, may work um, in contemporary international environment, in contemporary security environment. Let me explain that uh, because the word nationalism in English and in Russian has clearly bad connotations, we started to use another wording. Now we say assertive policy, assertiveness. We say China is pursuing assertive policy because of the, the, the idea of peaceful rise of China may have some very dangerous things, uh, connotations for Russia and Japan and Korea and whoever, and America, of course. We also say that uh, we see signs of assertiveness in Japanese domestic policy, politics because we see that Mr. Koizumi somehow quite successfully is building consensus uh, on the um, possibility of reconsidering the national constitution. I'm not saying whether it's too good or too bad, whatever. 
But we see that he much closer to the, such consensus in Japan than anybody of his predecessors in previous decades. We also see we use in Russia the word assertiveness when defining the substance of foreign policy of Republican administration in your country. Um, and finally, of course, when we discuss our own president, we see that Russia is getting less liberal and uh, Putin's policy are getting more assertive. The question is, however, whether it is for the good or for the bad from point of view of prospect of uh, uh, Russo-Japanese uh, rapprochement. Uh, I agree totally. The brilliant presentation earlier today by David Wolf, uh, he, he mentioned similar things. He said that uh, Putin um, has a talent uh, to be unexpected. He, he, he loves surprises. Indeed, he does. Uh, and uh, 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 the thing he performed on September 5th, uh, the 5th all, all proves that he indeed, this is the way he, um, he sees um, the tactics necessary to be exploited in the current conditions. So uh, there are two, the question is whether we have Putin's window or not. My guess that we do have Putin's window, but probably it's not too big, and it, it, it may not last long. Um, there are three bad news and three good news about it. <laughs> if we start from good news, I think that, first of all, this new social program uh, may uh, help the president to regain popular support, which badly needed domestically to perform any initiate in unpopular by definition, unpopular initiative internationally. Second good news is that despite there is a strong uh, nationalistic opposition in Russia uh, to president, uh, the core of the opposition is in Duma. However, uh, people in Duma are very vulnerable right now for the time being, vis-a-vis -vis any major pressures on, the, on Putin's side, because um, uh, they're going to be reelected very soon. And uh, with view how unpopular all the Duma parties are in Russia, much depends on how Putin is going to use his administrative report, whom he's going to support, those have better chances to be reelected. So Duma would clearly criticize the president, but the extent to which they are going to criticize him may depend. So in this sense, I also agree with American speakers. As for bad news, uh, I would say that first of all, uh, even to initiate something unpopular, Putin needs a very grave incentive. Why should he make this concession? It is unclear to Putin. It is unclear to his close ads. It is unclear to Russian public. So uh, there, there must be something easy to explain. This is what is lacking. Another, the, the second point is that we still unaware uh, to, to what extent Japan, Japanese elite, is ready to, to be prudent. It means to limit uh, expectations vis-a-vis -vis Putin, vis-a-vis -vis Russia. <laughs> if they are radical as they used to be many times, well, again, that would never work. And finally, very important thing, you know, the security and international environment in the region is changing. And the way it's being changed is not favorable for Japan, uh, for Japanese requirements, because um, unlike 20, uh, 20 years ago, the regional environment has become rather competitive. It's, it's extremely unusual for me, being Russian, to see that, I, uh, that there is a competition between China and Japan over relations with Russia. I also foresee rising competition between American energy companies and Japanese energy companies in dealing with uh, energy resources of Sakhalin. So uh, I wouldn't say that the time works for the benefit of Japan, which is a new thing. Uh, let me go further. 
uh, and speak about Americans' role. I would say that uh, the role by the United States is overwhelming. Uh, but in a most unexpected way, just to say that Americans' influence over Russian foreign and domestic policy means to say nothing. You should to follow what is the machinery of their influence. And the machinery is rather peculiar. For instance, what we see is that there is such thing uh, as behavioral patterns, the way Americans behave, the way President Bush behaves. When we analyze the way President Putin behaves, it's, it's visible that he imitates President Bush in many specific things. We started to write about that a couple of years ago. Uh, puzzling enough, nobody punished us for that. <laughs> probably, they, probably they did not got the message. But anyway, we published it. <laughs> uh, anyway, uh, so my guess is that uh, it's probably quite good that there is such a sophisticated machinery, even if he imitates President Bush, uh, even if he imitates some unpleasant features of President Bush behavior. Uh, th that may produce a sort of psychological inertia, and we can say, okay, if you imitate Americans here, why not to imitate them somewhere else? And there is another example, the Nixon example. The Nixon example, uh, I think, uh, produces with a quite useful parallel to how it may be performed. Uh, the difference is, however, Nixon had a very clear reason why he needed improved relations with China. And it was quite easy for him to explain it to the Congress. Uh, there was a major strategic gain in confrontation with the Soviet Union uh, that was related to improvement relations with China. We don't have similar explanation uh, in the case of Japan. So we have in mind this Nixon example, but we cannot just imitate it. Uh, but there is a, a, another example. Uh, there is uh, a mode of behavior uh, by which the United States uh, actually forced Japan and South Korea to build better relations. We know quite well that for the time being, relations between South Korea and Japan are not so harmonic. There are lots of to be told to each other. And when you uh, discuss it frankly with South Koreans, we are quite critical uh, towards Japanese. Uh, that never prevents both nations to have quite good relations. That never prevents American somehow regulate frictions between South Korea and Japan. And I think that's a quite workable mode of building relations. Uh, I, I'm quite sure that uh, to have normal stability in the region we can afford some degree of disagreements between parties. Nothing bad about it. So if South Korea and Japan can disagree on many things, but it never produces a war, it never produces a risk of war, so why not to try to have similar things between Russia and Japan? Let them disagree. Let them disagree on many things, but let them agree on a basis of limited compromise. Neither you, nor Russia, nor, nor we. Uh, and here where I see Americans, uh, Americans' role may be very useful. The overall uh, significance of American participation in regional affairs, as we see in Russia, is that the United States provides the overall stability to the region. Let it be in place. This is what we want. Let us try to go slowly to the extent when both parties, I mean Japan and Russia, are ready to invite American mediation, whatever. But uh, first of all, Russia and Japan need to understand they are ready for major mutual concession. That's it. Thank you. Ambassador Togo, please.
Tonight's theme is the uh, Japan-Russia war. And the greatest hero of that war, as is understood in Japan and probably throughout the world, throughout the world uh, is Admiral Heihachiro Togo. My name happened to be Kazuhiko Togo. <laughs> in Japanese, you write exactly the same. So during my service in the foreign ministry, I've been asked sometimes, Mr. Togo, are you related to Admiral Togo? <laughs> well, no, I'm sorry. <laughs> however, however, the name of Togo in Japan is concentrated in one prefecture of Kagoshima, the southernest prefecture uh, of the island of Kyushu. Admiral Togo comes from a, 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 a traditional aristocrat aristocratic family uh, of the Kagoshima city. And my grandfather, Shigenori Togo, who was also in the foreign service, twice foreign ministers during the World War II, comes from the Kagoshima prefecture, but not uh, from the uh, central part of Kagoshima city, but from a small village called Miyama, about one hour drive from Kagoshima city. And this village is Miyama, is a, is a village constituted by former Koreans who were deported at the end of the 15th century by Toyotomi Hideyoshi, Korean pottery makers. And throughout the fourth century, they have uh, structured a fairly close society. And my great grandfather, whose name was Kim before then, adopted the name of Togo. <laughs> so throughout those, those long four centuries, some Korean blood is running in me. <laughs> now let's come to the Japan-Russia uh, war. <laughs> Today, I want to uh, line out three points. How Japan-Russia war is affecting, uh, and the Japan-Russia war in the Portmas Treaty is affecting contemporarily today's Japanese foreign policy. And the three, uh, three factors vary in degree in, in nature. But I would like to take up the first issue, which really has a direct consequence. And this is the issue of Korea. Korea. You know, Japan-Russia war was, was, for Japan, was a war of survival. Russia was coming from north, and Japan wanted to secure independence. And for that, we thought that keeping away Russian from the Korean Peninsula is the first and most important purpose of, of the war. We waged the war, we won the war, and we concluded the, the Portmas Treaty. And we achieved this objective. However, for the Koreans, it was a different story. Portmas Treaty, in which Japan got the prerogatives over the peninsula, became the starting point of Korean humiliation and indignation against Japan. In five years' time, after the Portsmouth Treaty, Japan annexed Korea. And for, so for, for the Koreans, Portsmouth Treaty, this, this five years of period from Portsmouth Treaty to the annexation is an inseparable process. And this is really tragic in a way. Because in a way, when Japan won the war, Many Koreans were rejoiced. Uh, An Chun Gun, who is a national hero in Korea, when he heard first about Japan's victory, he wrote in his Oriental Peace Theory that we comrades in Korea and in China, we are rejoiced by Japan's victory as if the victory was gained by us, ourselves. And yet, and yet, four years later, An Chong-gun assassinated Ito Hirobumi at the station of Harbin, arrested and soon executed by Japan. And he became the national hero of Korea for Korean independence. So it, it's a very, very heavy historical, uh, historical, uh, recognition for Japan. 
And in a way, in a way Japan throughout the uh, last 50 years has tried to combine these two memories. And a lot of things are now discussed in textbook issues. I try to, to study a little bit how our textbook has changed in the last 50 years. But I think it is fair to say that it is a process in which Japan is trying to combine our national memory in the, in the Korean memory in the same textbook in Japan. For Japan, for Japan, Russo-Japanese war and the Portman Treaty is one package. For the Koreans, even if they could have appraised, praised uh, Japan's victory over the war, not the Portman Treaty, which is the beginning of their humiliation and indignation against Japan. Now, secondly, secondly, China. China is a bit different story, because as we have today discussed in the symposium, uh, you know, in the in, in Portsmouth Treaty, there was agreement on Manchuria. Uh, Chinese sovereignty over Manchuria was not denied, but Russia maintained the major major instrument of uh, imperial government, the railroad, the so-called uh, East China Railroad, whereas Japan got the Southern Manchurian Railroad. But the, the sources of indignation does not come from this from China against Japan. It comes from what we call the 15 years of, of war uh, between China and Japan, starting from 1931, Manchurian incident, ending uh, 1945. However, in considering today's pol political scenery, there is one aspect which the Portmas Treaty had brought in a direct imprint to the post uh, World War II international politics. And that, in a way, <laughs> in a way, amazingly, was done through Yalta. Yalta Agreement of February 1945. The paragraph C, or, or, or subparagraph C of paragraph two of Yalta reads as follows. The Chinese Eastern Railroad in the South Manchurian Railroad which provides an outlet to Dairen, shall be jointly operated by the establishment of a joint Soviet-Chinese company, it being understood that the preeminent interest of the Soviet Union shall be safeguarded and that China shall retain uh, full sovereignty in Manchuria. Well, <laughs> several decades ago, when in the Japanese foreign ministry, I saw this first paragraph for the first time. <sighs> it was shocking. It was, <laughs> let me say it out It was really shocking. F for me, it, it, it looked like a replica of Portsmouth Treaty. Or, or let me put otherwise. It looked like a replica of the Portsmouth Treaty, which Russian Empire wanted to conclude had they won the war. Well, the, the northern railroad is secured in this newly, newly formed, but secured for, 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 for the Soviet Union. Uh, Southern Manchurian Railroad, which uh, was transferred to, uh, we, uh, about which Japan got its uh, prerogative, is now under, uh, uh, under Soviet prerogative. And so this, uh, this portion of, um, of uh, RALT agreement kept effect for nine years, from 1945 to 1954. While Stalin was in command of the Soviet Union, this uh, um, provision was kept in, uh, effective, and it was only after uh, Stalin died in 1953 uh, that in 1954, in the newly emerging period of Seoul under Khrushchev, that uh, Khrushchev and Mao decided that uh, this portion would become void. So I certainly do not want to exaggerate the meaning of this now, now voided uh, portion of Yalta. However, however, Portsmouth Treaty is after all in history. Yalta, Yalta is not necessarily in history. Yalta created an important foundation of the post-World War II international relations in which still all of us are living. So I think it is uh, worthwhile giving some thought about this implication of, of this voided portion, because Yalta 
has a repercussion in other issues. And uh, giving some thought on this voided portion might uh, bring in some better understanding of the significance of Yalta to the contemporary uh, international relations. Now, thirdly, lastly, about the uh, repercussion of uh, Portsmouth to uh, contemporary today's Japan-Russia uh, uh, bi bi Japan bilateral relations, the theme which I think is the major theme which we are going to discuss tonight. Well, uh, as you know, when Portsmouth Treaty was concluded, it was not popular in Japan. Uh, people became angry because we did not get any reparations and the, the portion of the land we got was only half of suffering. It was, it was far, far, far uh, uh, insufficient. So there was riot, demonstration, popular anger. But now for the diplomats, Japanese diplomats in posterity, Portsmouth Treaty is a kind of dream treaty. Dream treaty. The Meiji leadership knew that the war had to be stopped. The Meiji government did not have power to continue the war. And so they were really prepared to come to peace with minimal requirement met. So they were prepared to abandon uh, reparations. They were prepared to abandon whole territorial request. And it was only, only, only due to this uh, lack of having got this information through the British Embassy. Pr practically that day before the treaty uh, was concluded that Nicholas II was prepared to abandon southern part of Sakhalin, that Japan got southern part of Sakhalin. It was a courage and correct decision, correct understanding of the national interest in long term, which m made then Meiji government position. Oh, <laughs> so for the diplomat in pos posterity, <laughs> will we be in a position to, 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 to contribute or to participate in such kind of negotiation? And however unpopular it might be, would we be in a position to do something about the remaining issue between Japan and Russia? Well, uh, six years have passed. And for this kind of real political decision, I think there are two conditions needed. One is the international environment, international conditions, which would make this kind of uh, uh, tough political decision necessary and possible. So, so the correct understanding of the situation. But the second, there's a need to come up with a format, a format which both sides can agree, format which may entail tough decision for both sides, but still acceptable to both. Are we in such an international situation? Would the two governments be able to find such format? In April 2001, uh, President Putin and Prime Minister Mori met in Irkutsk. And the, the essence of the territorial issues, as uh, we know, is the question of the belongingness of the four islands. And the historical accumulation led to the following situation, that basically, basically for the Soviet Russian government, they can go, to, go, go uh, as a maximum concession transfer of the two smaller islands. It, 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 it's generally understood as a maximum concession to transfer the two smaller islands, Habomai and Shikota, maximum concession from Russian side. And from Japanese side, the situation looks different. From Japanese side, their minimum requirement, and this makes the whole negotiation so difficult, minimum requirement is to have the four islands adding the two large islands, Kunashide Etoro, transferred to Japan. So Russia, two, as minimum uh, concession. Japan, four, as a, 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 a sorry, as a maximum, as ma maximum concession from Russia, and from Japan, as a minimum requirement, four islands. How to bridge that, this gap? This is what I mean, this format. 
<laughs> thank you, thank you. Yeah, my suggestion. However, in Irkutsk, we have not reached that point. We have not reached. We have reached only to the, the, the uh, for, formula of negotiations, and that was what we called parallel negotiations. On one hand, conduct negotiations on the two smaller islands, two smaller islands, the fate of which is uh, stipulated in 1956 six joint declaration that the two small islands be transferred to Japan after the conclusion of the peace treaty. And the, but parallel to this negotiation, to conduct a down-to-earth, real head-on discussions on the sovereignty of the two large islands, about which we do not have any agreement yet. But it was hoped in Irkutsk that if we continue these parallel negotiations, the outcome of the first could possibly have a positive impact on the, out, on the process of the second, and the outcome of the second might even have a positive impact to the, to the first. And hence, getting some kind of a decision which require tough uh, will, in, in, in courage, and wisdom, and, and, so, and, so, and, so, and so forth. Unfortunately, due to a political confusion and some serious policy strife in Japan, that uh, situation collapsed. Primarily, this I must say in, with all my honesty, primarily due to Japanese situation. And for four years, basically nothing substantial, substantial is moving on this issue. Koizumi-san is going to be re-elected tomorrow. And <laughs> according with all uh, newspaper rep reports, with a resounding victory probably. President Putin will be there for another three years at minimum. Now, would we be, would we find this objective international conditions? And uh, would the two governments find some mutually acceptable solution which may require courage and decision and toughness? But hoping, hoping with a flare of memory from Portsmouth. Thank you. Well, let me first begin by saying it's so wonderful to be the absolute last speaker <laughs> of a conference. Uh, but I do want to use the occasion, first of all, to thank Ken Yalowitz and his colleagues for putting this together to commemorate a particular historic moment, a particular set of events that in many ways have shaped, I think as all of us agreed today and over the last few days, uh, much of the kind of complexion and set of relationships that do exist in this very, very important part of the world that we couldn't agree on what to call today, but <laughs> somehow it's bounded uh, by the shores of the Pacific, and it includes uh, the lands from China all the way up through Alaska and around on the other side. Now, I think there are a few things to me that I take away from the conference, and then I will come to a couple of thoughts about, is there anything to do? Um, I mentioned today, uh, as we were wrapping up the conference, that I thought one of the things that the Treaty of Portsmouth taken as a whole and it's as a process and as a, as a completed event in some sense does offer is something of a model for a successful negotiation of a conflict that whatever the objective reasons for its conclusion might not have concluded and that we therefore uh, do have a body of informed knowledge at this point that helps us understand what conditions and what kind of surroundings and contexts are required to have a successful outcome when you come up against one of these real and very bitter conflicts. And I think uh, we explored many of those during the conference but I thought one of the first and basic points I would make is, in some sense, to pick up from what uh, Ambassador Togo 
was saying about the diplomats at Portsmouth. Diplomacy does not occur in a vacuum. Diplomacy is what takes place in a particular place and between and amongst a group of people. But surrounding them, as we heard throughout the conference, is a body of forces and influences and intellectual constructs and emotions that all must be taken into account and brought together successfully by the diplomats and their political leaders in a way that allows usually some form of compromise to take place. Everybody has to leave the table unhappy and everyone has to leave the table to some extent satisfied. If you don't have that, you will not have a lasting agreement or a treaty. I think that's certainly a lesson one takes away from almost any negotiation or any agreement that we study throughout history and it certainly is true of the Treaty of Portsmouth. Yes, the treaty in many ways didn't s resolve the issues that were to come and be a burden to its construct for many years afterwards. But it did solve the immediate problem of stopping the killing. And it did stop the expenditure of treasure and the terrible, terrible potential consequences of a continuing conflict. It rearranged the problem. It did not satisfy Russians or Japanese, or probably Theodore Roosevelt for that matter completely. But it did move things a new, to a new stage and it did create a new context. Second point I would make is that in some sense this took place, at least as I interpreted what we heard today, at a time when in, in large part, the world system was in rapid flux and change. That everything from communications and the way people were able to formulate their thinking about each other to the way nation states were beginning to look at each other's ambitions and potential to uh, the fact of a group of status quo powers looking very, very jealously and suspiciously at a group of new wannabe powers, Japan and the United States. Things were changing. The status quo was under great pressure. And into this mix, you dropped this conflict. Or the conflict perhaps erupted because of this mix. But what it, what it did, you had a situation of flux and you had a conflict, but what it afforded was, in fact, an opportunity for someone like Theodore Roosevelt to take an initiative and basically try something new or to try to assert that you could do something that you hadn't done before or perhaps discuss in a new way how a very traditional kind of uh, phenomenon between states, a war, could be addressed in new ways or perhaps could be taken on in a new way by this you know, young power that was going to show up and say, let's try something new. It took political courage. It took a rather different way of thinking, I think, about the world. And it took uh, a capacity to think through how you could construct such a formula. Again, I come back to what Ambassador Togo said, that the format mattered how you got people to come together to think about this problem. And I would simply say that I think there is something of a legacy from Portsmouth in this sort of set of conditions and set of considerations that we should have in mind in addressing perhaps whether it's the territories issue or fr frankly others that may be out in, in front of us. Um, the third point uh, is that this was a time for the United States when we really were the new guy on the block, the new power. Uh, we'd been around for a few years, but compared to many, uh, indeed most other states or, or powers, and even compared to Japan, which certainly was far from a new state or society, 
we were uh, putting forth a set of ideas and uh, a, a kind of use of power in the international system in ways that no one knew quite how to, to accept or adjust to. And Theodore Roosevelt was a bit of a character. I mean, he, you know, he did not do things in many ways in conventional ways. And that was perhaps part of his success. Uh, he, uh, in many ways, at least if I understand the history correctly, did do things that people did not expect. And he did them in ways that they did not expect. Now, in short, he created context uh, by doing things in a different way and, and giving people a new way of looking at themselves or the way they could approach them. Fourthly was the diplomatic role, the role of the diplomats or the negotiators. Uh, I agree with uh, uh, both of my colleagues that this negotiation uh, was first and foremost a matter of two groups of people sitting down and coming up with a solution and a formula that was going to work for their political leaders at home. And we know that Theodore Roosevelt also participated in this, perhaps indirectly, but that the American voice was also a part of this process. What's critical was that these particular sets of negotiators were in a position to assess the context they had to work in, to find formulas that were minimally acceptable to both their leaderships, and also to have the courage to assist their leaders to sell them when they, when, they, uh, when they took them home. The, the, the courage of the diplomats is a terribly important part, but also their creativity. You cannot, in my experience, and I think we, all of us who were in the diplomatic business would say you cannot assume that an outcome is sort of foreordained. It takes creativity, patience, and a sense that you have to come to a conclusion in order to get through a negotiation like this. These people did it here, and they did it with the assistance of the President of the United States and his people. This kind of thing has been done, uh, as I mentioned today, once again uh, in the Middle East context at Camp David by President Carter. It's a rare thing however, for presidents or leaders of, of a nation to put themselves or expose themselves to the real potential for failure in such negotiations. And I think it's important to realize that one is going to have to have the leaders with the courage to create these kinds of conditions for negotiators to be able to work. I don't know if we have it today, but without it, I'm rather convinced that problems or issues like the Northern Territories question or, the, or, the, or this current issue are not going to be solved in and of themselves. It's been 60 years. If we've lived 60 years with it, I see nothing right now on the horizon that says we can't live a few more. Now, uh, that said, uh, I want to conclude with one uh, rather more positive thought or, or hopeful thought about I do think that leaders can create conditions. I think it requires of them, as, and if we look at uh, perhaps not so much Treaty of Portsmouth, but at, at many other uh, circumstances uh, not unlike the, the, the situation that we found 100 years ago, leaders can create and begin to shape the images that are necessary in order to have a context emerge that they can work within. I happen to believe that one of the real problems in this particular issue is that neither Japan nor Russia, at, at least in my memory, has really had leaderships who tried to change the views at the same time. Some have tried one, at one point, or perhaps had the conditions at one time but the other side missed. Then the other side has tried at times and the counterpart missed. One of the things that's been missing frequently often was the third party. And here I would say that the United States has been equally absent at certain critical times. 
we were preoccupied in other areas or we had other things on our mind. And I think the one thing that has been missing in this particular issue of finalizing the peace and settling the last issues of the Second World War in Asia has been the kind of uh, both concentrated interests and concentrated effort and attention from the United States as well as the parties concerned that we had so often in Europe over many, many uh, of the other issues. It just hasn't been there. Now, I do think there is one opportunity coming, and I, or perhaps it's better to say there is, a, there is a context that exists that might lead here to something better and something more positive, and that's the G8. Uh, Mr. Putin is going to head the G8 this year. He is heading it this year. We will have a summit in Moscow. The G8, after all, is, is a rather exclusive club. Uh, it is the kind of place, to me, or I believe, where an issue like the one that is in front of two of its members can, in fact, be discussed over time and perhaps a context created in which you, you find a way through. I don't know whether this is the, the, the moment. I do think it's the only one sort of event or context on the horizon that I can see that might offer some hope that leaders could, in fact, get together or have their representatives get together and begin to say, we really need to put this behind us. Too much else is happening in Asia. We have a whole new world emerging in Asia, as we heard most of the conference. And really to be burdened by this piece of history is something that we can hardly afford. Uh, I think I will stop only to say that I hope uh, that may be the case. Uh, I am not completely sanguine by any means, but I do believe that the possibility exists. And so I, with that, hope that this conference might inform some of those who will take part in all of this, uh, that the, the papers and the thoughts that emerge during this conference uh, can be uh, used both to inform not only the students and others of all of you who are in the academy, but perhaps uh, the publics increasingly broadly in those countries that are affected by this particular issue. Thank you very much. Questions? Come. I think that there's another context, possible context, besides the GA, and it was mentioned today, which is the, the six party talk. Yeah. That could develop into a format, even a five party talk. The question there, I think, and I'd like to ask the panel, is whether dealing with Korea and with the denuclearization of Korea, which also will take courage and sacrifice and, and sustain political effort, may not exhaust whatever energy might be left over to help with the Russia-Japan issue. I mean, I think Countries have a limited amount of political energy. Uh, in Northeast Asia, it's going to be concentrated for the immediate future on the Korean issue. Is there going to be anything left over for Russia and Japan? Uh, it's a good provocative idea to see uh, six-party talks as something. Uh, the problem, however, may relate not to Russia, though to Russia too, but primarily to the United States. Because as I read uh, the experience of uh, six-party talks over the recent two and a half years, there were several cases that de facto the United States uh, were almost isolated, de facto, in the group. So if uh, the American side, well, somehow is accustomed to that, but we can live with this, that would probably be a favorable precondition. Uh, another thing is Russia. 
On the one hand, Russia is more and more accustomed to its lower profile in international negotiations. On the other hand, well, uh, th that would be a sort of psychological trauma for, for Russian leadership. But if Americans say, we accept it, we accept the possibility of being isolated in this body, that would probably uh, would be accepted by Russia too. But, but uh, it's a good question to what extent all the parties are mature for such a thing. So, uh, and one more, smaller things. In case we attempt to use six-party talks in the sense you suggest, what would be reaction of smaller nations of the regions? Because ASEAN has spent, well, God knows how, three decades, they were building something of their own exactly to, to manage in, uh, the regional security. And now they he, they're going to have a competing body. Well, what would be their reaction? Most probably negative. Um, this context of G8, or either G8 or six-party talks uh, in um, utilizing or mobilizing for the resolution of the territorial issues, bilateral Russia-Japan territorial issues. Well, I think there has been some history on, uh, on uh, considering the territorial issues within the context of G8. In a nutshell, I mean, at least from Japan's perspective, we, we, we then call this international, internationalization to put the territorial issues discussion in the context of the G8. But uh, in a nutshell, it was a total failure. And the primary reason was that Russia didn't want it. Please correct me <laughs> if I'm wrong, but Russia Russia didn't want it. Russia, Russia took it as uh, pressuring Russia uh, from this one-to-one -one position, uh, from seven-to-one position on the territory issue. And they took it as a threat. And, and, and the greatest failure in this direction was the uh, G, uh, well, it was still G7 plus one when Yeltsin wow. came in 1992. Uh, and uh, it, was a sort of, uh, it was one of the real reasons why Yeltsin cancelled his visit in September. So, you know, uh, in terms of the general thinking, I think uh, how the G8 countries view this issue and how the countries of East Asia view this issue clearly is uh, related to the bilateral negotiations. And uh, both Russia and Japan have to take into account and it is very important. However, if we want to bring in this issue on a particular international organization and have a serious discussion there, so far, so far, uh, that has not proven to be successful. I think as a starting point, I mean, really, f pr first of all, it will depend on, uh, depend on the will and the determination of the leadership in, uh, in Moscow uh, and in Tokyo. If, the, if they are there, and if there are real um, negotiations, real wish to do something about each issue, then, then Japan and Russia might come up with a first other call to the United States, or if we can agree uh, to put it in the framework of, uh, of, uh, of the five countries in Northeast Asia. But unless the two countries have this joint determination uh, it's not easy to bring it into a uh, multilateral framework. Well, may I add one comment to, to mm -hmm. <laughs> Jim mentioned? Uh, I think in the whole history, <laughs> in the whole post-war history of these negotiations, there was extremely, but one short, extremely short period in which basically the approach of the Russian administration and Japanese administration uh, went parallel, coincided. Mm -hmm. And it is uh, seven months, starting from September 2000 to March 2001. This, during these seven months, uh, both countries had a lot of internal uh, strife. Uh, however, in terms of the negotiators, uh, Putin and Mori, and between the foreign ministers, and on, a, on an administrative uh, level, there was a uh, really emerging 
uh, understanding, not, not on the conclusion. Conclusion <laughs> was a bit far, but on the approach, how, how, how to bring two positions closer. And in my view, you know, <laughs> in the whole history, this was the only period when the two sides had basically the same thinking. But as I said, you know, it collapsed in, in April 19, uh, sorry, April 2001. And uh, I'm afraid, as far as my observation goes, it is not uh, there today. No, that's OK. Ambassador. I thank all uh, three presenters for uh, really excellent presentations tonight. In my view, uh, in order to understand, uh, understand the international situations, we have to have a very good understanding of political system. That's my point. And also, uh, the point is that uh, I'm a little bit concerned about uh, Russian uh, foreign policy recently. Uh, several months ago, uh, Russia uh, tried to intervene into the uh, presidential election to the neighboring country in Bain. And then uh, they are applying some pressure to the Central Asian countries. Uh, now they are uh, proposing to establish, a, in, the in the United Nations, they are proposing uh, to establish a center for preventive diplomacy in Turkmenistan. Prevent from what is uh, something <laughs> I, I'm concerned. Uh, Turkmenistan is the most uh, uh, <laughs> authoritarian regime among those uh, five countries and then also they on the edge of those uh, five countries they are trying to establish a uh, preventive diplomacy I, I I'm worried if it's not uh, uh, preventive preventing uh, democratization from taking place in those areas also there was a uh, uh, Shanghai uh, cooperation organization which is now uh, strengthening and then now they are demanding uh, U.S. going out from that region. Uh, also, there was a, a China-Russia uh, uh, joint uh, military exercise recently. Uh, in a word, I, I think uh, Russia is uh, quite uh, rapidly becoming uh, reactionary, <laughs> very simply stated. Uh, I, I, what I feel on these changes that uh, my question is that uh, whether or not Russia can really become uh, democratized or they are coming back to the reversal course. Uh, uh, in, in a sense, um, um, Russia is a, uh, this is not a criticism or this is not a support, uh, just an observation. Russia is a too big country to be democratized. That's my concern. Because there are many big countries, uh, US, India, <coughs> democracy, but they are on um, basically a federal system. They have a strong basis, local autonomy or state autonomy, and on which is a presidential power is conferred. But uh, uh, in Russia, uh, in order to integrate such a huge, vast area of the land, uh, probably the very strong power is necessary. And then uh, that's a course Mr. Putin is going to, I'm concerned, and then uh, in order to be very really strong, the leader cannot show any weakness uh, to the people. So uh, the discussion of the uh, territory issue should be also understand from this kind of context. That's uh, my uh, question and concern. Thank you so much. Thank you for your comment rather than question. Uh, let me answer by comment of comment. <laughs> I don't see any other possibility. Uh, so, um, sounds like uh, uh, Mr. Ambassador knows for sure what democracy is. If you compare American democracy with what you call democracy in Japan, or what they call democracy in Lithuania, that would be very different political regimes. Uh, we never claimed in Russia, even our crazy liberals of early 90s never claimed they are going or they are able to build a democracy uh, like they have in America. Because in many respects, American democracy is something quite unique. 
Uh, and I also believe uh, that democracy, the form of democracy, uh, always relates to climatic conditions and to geography in any imaginable respect. So for me, it's clear that the degree of democracy uh, in Russia would always be different than that in France. I also believe that the perception of how much freedom, of how much liberty, and how much order we need in our country would also be much different <coughs> from that in Poland or in Czech Republic or whatever. So uh, there are, you know, diversities, divergences within the democratic model. This is one thing. The second thing is that degree of maturity of each democratic model, well, they somehow relates to history. After 15 years of reforms, I would say, I would never to say what kind of reform it were. Uh, in Russia, we still have what we have. And I would say uh, not to praise or criticize any of the two presidents Russia had in the course of these 15 years, that uh, the, the advancement towards democracy, towards stable democracy, uh, for me living inside Russia is quite obvious. We have different regime than the one we had under Yeltsin. Uh, I cannot say the present regime is totally worse than the previous one. Neither the previous one nor this one can be defined as purely democratic regime or purely liberal regime. If you noticed, American writers started to um, state a couple of years ago that democracy and liberal democracy is not exactly the same. So I think Russia is, uh, how to say it, a country of democratic orientation. We are moving in that direction. Uh, but we are not a liberal country in your sense, or rather in American sense. Hopefully, we're going to be more liberal in some times. So um, the third point is whether you should analyze uh, practical uh, international issues well, w w when putting so much emphasis on things like domestic institutions, forms and democracy and so far. I think that our field, uh, to the extent diplomacy is involved, needs a little bit more pragmatism. Sometimes pragmatism sounds quite cynical, yes, uh, but sometimes it is fruitful due to the fact it's a little bit cynical. So who would measure the acceptable uh, degree of it? So morals and cynicism in practical diplomacy, to the extent I know the field, well, somehow can live together, whether we like it or not. So finally, I fail to understand what you mean by Russia's attempt to intervene into, uh, into affairs of some neighboring countries. My, uh, my reading of that events would be totally different, 100% different. Uh, uh, Russia puzzled myself how tolerant she was uh, to what was defined in Russian media as American intervention in Ukraine or, or, or somewhere else. You know, I, I would say that President uh, disregard all his personal uh, characters, uh, features. He is remarkably tolerant to what is being done in this neighboring belt of countries. I'd just like to make one point about this, by the way. Uh, I do think there's one condition that is going to be required to resolve this issue, and that is you're going to have, strong le have to have strong leadership in both Tokyo and in Moscow. Weak leadership, I think, if we look around the region or at almost any uh, troublesome conflict uh, all over uh, the globe these days is rarely resolved satisfactorily when you do not have the strength in the leaders to make the decisions that can last. And I would simply submit that it's very doubtful 
that a lasting solution to this issue, particularly with its long and complicated history now, is ever going to come if one side feels weak and the other strong. You're going to have to have two strong, courageous leaders in order to make the decisions. Yes. I am a little bit confused about the status of Manjuria, which is a large territory in that area. I remember that in the early years after the Russian Revolution, Manjuria became a refuge for white Russians, people who were against Soviet dominate, domination. And there were rich uh, uh, manufacturers and there were uh, admirals of the Russian Navy and so on. And Harbin was established as a Russian city with newspapers and schools and so on. What is the status of Manjuria now? And what is the population? Are they Manjurians? Are they Chinese? Are they Mongols? I really don't know. Yes, indeed, that was a, a wonderful and very interesting and anomalous moment. Unfortunately, most of the Russians left after China became communist in 1949. There were still a few left, and then after those few were gone, then there were a few people who were half Russian and half Chinese left, and now pretty much everyone's gone. Maybe there's a few people still left in... Um, homes of some kind, but they're all very old. So the Russian period there is over, except that now the borders are open with Russia in that area, so there are Russians who come through on a temporary basis. Um, once upon a time, Harbin was about 50-50 Chinese and Russian. Vladivostok at the time was also 50-50 Russian and Chinese. Now Manchuria, what used to be called Manchuria and is no longer called Manchuria, has a population of ballpark 150 million, and they're all Chinese. Uh, uh, what I know is that there were three ways by which uh, Russians left Manjuria. One way was that to Australia, another one to California, and the part of Russian uh, who were more or less loyal to the Soviet Union, they were taken back to the Soviet Union, and, and no, not all of them were arrested or whatever. For instance, my, my teacher of Japanese in the university was so-called Harbinian from that guard who came, came back to the Soviet Union uh, f from Harbin. Uh, according to Chinese official statistic, Chinese official statistic never indicates any Russian presence in Manjuria, while they indicate a small Russian minority in Xinjiang. That's it. Jen, did you have your hand up? Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. Are there any other questions? No. Okay. Well, this, this does wrap it up. <laughs> Thank you all very, very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs>